G'day guys, Mark of the Outer Circle, and in today's episode of Getting Started in the Horus Heresy, we're going to have a quick overview of the different legions. This is kind of similar to the part ones we did, but we want to go a little bit more in depth with the legions, sort of preferred tactics, types of armor, that sort of thing. So the Dark Angels Legion is where we'll start. Now the Dark Angels Legion are uh, very much the all-rounder legion with an emphasis towards knightly honor, knightly virtue, single combat, that sort of thing. Within their structure, being the first legion, they created what we call the wings. And the wings are uh, basically different breakdowns of their structure that include the death wing, raven wing, dread wing, fire wing, iron wing, and I believe the storm wing. These different uh, breakdowns of the structure refer to specific skill sets within the legion so for example the death wing are the elite veteran companies this will be full generally of terminators death wing companions uh, veterans will all be in there the raven wing is mostly your bikes your jet bikes your land speeders all those sort of formations the dread wing is where you'll find all the really nasty stuff in the Legion, like your destroyer units, use of radiation weapons, crawling fire, uh, napalm, all that sort of thing. Firewing is where you're going to find your, uh, your more subtle methods of killing in many ways, your assassination forces. So you'll generally find the Moritats in there, uh, not necessarily with the Dreadwing. You'll find your Vigilators, many of your different scout companies will be in there. Uh, stalkers, different types of units are designed to basically kill off the upper echelons of their enemy's forces. The Iron Wing is, funny enough, it's iron in the name. It refers to the tank companies or the armoured assets of the Legion. And lastly, the Storm Wing. The Storm Wing are pretty much everyone else. So breaches, assault squads, tactical marines, uh, all that sort of thing fits into the Storm Wing and is the largest wing. Now, these six different wing types do have representation upon the tabletop in the game. So you can tailor your list after these wings. And more so than any other legion, the Dark Angels really lean into this. In the other legions that came after the Dark Angels, they tended to sort of lump all of these things together into a single army, whereas the Dark Angels tend to deploy these things individually. It is sort of a rare occasion when you would use multiple wings simultaneously instead you would use a specific wing to accomplish a specific task in the dark angels force now this is a good point in the video to note that although legions lean towards a specific style of fighting combat unit armor whatever it may be there is scope to use anything you like with any of the legions white scars do use dreadnoughts night lords do use tanks this is the thing. However, don't get too carried away in this, but it is usually nicer to adhere more towards the fluff because we're generally trying to tell a narrative story in the Horus Heresy. And if you want to deviate away from that narrative story, then, well, let's just say you better have come up with a very good narrative. Otherwise, it's not that people are going to tease you, pick on you, any of that sort of thing. This community is not like that. It's more just people are going to question it and say, well, why did you make that stylistic design choice if things are not better off for having it? So when it comes to the Dark Angels themselves over here on Forge World, you do have quite a few options to upgrade them with. I am willing to bet money that the Leviathan Siege Dreadnought that you have here is going to end up in the same place as the Contemptor Dreadnought for the Dark Angels. They will stop producing the arms and legs for it, and it will just become a torso upgrade to go with the Games Workshop plastic kit. I just have that feeling, and I think many of you would probably share that thought. When it comes to the actual units available, there are Dreadwing Interrupters. Funny enough, belong to the Dreadwing, the Destroyer Cadres, that sort of thing. That's where they fit in. The Praetor, both of them, either in Cataphracty or, or in the Power Armor, they will work with pretty much any formation, especially down to how you paint them. The Inner Circle Knights Synovium are veterans of the Deathwing First Company, as are the Deathwing Companions, who are a type of command squad. 
So you will not see many companions in an army, but you can potentially see many in a Circle Knight Cenobium. Of course, there are special characters, but I don't, I don't really recommend special characters to armies, especially when you're freshly starting out. Uh, it's more impressive to, unless you're playing a campaign, you know, directly using, say, book missions from the old black books. You don't really need the characters unless you've really worked them in there into the story of why they are being used. Just create your own characters. It's more fun. The Dark Angels, of course, tend to gravitate towards Mark II power armor, Crusade pattern, because they wear a lot of it. Uh, they've been fighting since the earliest days of the Great Crusade, and even were fighting the most during the Unification Wars. They have the most access to Mark II armor, and because the Dark Angels are usually right at the edges of the galaxy, performing their fighting role, they lack the resupply that would see them getting issued with the newer types of armor. So moving on from the Dark Angels now, we get to the Emperor's Children. The Emperor's Children are, of course, traitors, unlike the Dark Angels. The Emperor's Children's focus prior to the Horus Heresy, and what is maintained by the Loyalist Emperor's Children, is perfection. The idea being that they want to be the best at every job within the Legion. If they are a breaching marine, they will be a better breaching marine than an Imperial Fist. If they are using a LAS cannon, they will be a better LAS cannon armed heavy support marine than the best Iron Warriors. If they are going to be an assault marine, they are going to be more bloodthirsty and more skillful than a Blood Angel or a World Eater. That is their combat philosophy, and it is reasonably well represented on the tabletop. They are definitely a strong Legion. Now, the Traitor's Empress children, on the other hand, took this too far. In their pursuit of perfection, they became perverse, they became enslaved by it, and we start seeing some really weird things happen. Now, downside the Legion is, if you do play Loyalists, all of the very strong war gear and units is locked away behind being a traitor, so you have a much more limited set of tools available to you with the Legion. That said, they're still quite strong. Now, the Emperor's Children's preferred method of combat is to pick the best tool for the situation, and they trained every single person within the Legion to be essentially equally capable at every single job. Every Marine was expected to be able to do every job within the Legion, and flawlessly, with the exception of highly specialized roles, such as Apothecaries and Tech Marines. Of course, the elite veteran units are exactly that. They're elite veteran units, and they are not subject to the same sets of rules. So there are obviously many different characters, special characters available to the Emperor's children. There are trader units, such as the Cacophony here, which are pretty damn cool. The favoured armour style for the Emperor's children is Mark IV. It is meant to be the ultimate in armour, and therefore the most close to perfection, therefore the Emperor's Children want it because they themselves are the closest to perfection. They have Emperor's Children have Phoenix Terminators in here as well as Palatine Blades to fulfill all their close combat needs. The Phoenix Terminators are more of an elite bodyguard unit and I would suggest probably using them a bit more sparingly. Uh, this is not the sort of Legion where you're going to see a lot of Pride of the Legion full of Phoenix Terminators. The Legion does not build well around that. As to special characters, same as the Dark Angels, don't go over the top with them. Uh, Emperor's Children are very good at dueling. They are a duelist's dream as a Legion, and they hit like a freight train on the charge. Be very scared of them, turn one of any combat, even if you're charging them. The next Legion along is another Traitor Legion force, and this is the Iron Warriors. Now, essentially, the Iron Warriors are fighting World War I all day, every day in the 40th, uh, in the 30th millennium, through to the 40th millennium, uh, 40k times. And due to this, let's just say it sent them a little bit insane because they've spent too much time in the trenches. They're very cold, very calculating, very callous. They are a firepower heavy legion, especially good at destroying buildings and armored vehicles. Their war gear and their specialist units, like the Tyrants, very much embody this design philosophy. Firepower at all costs, and many of their Legion units have a lot of custom armor or up-armoring that has occurred on them in order to make them more resilient, 
and stronger at that assault mentality. So you're going to see a lot of Mark III power armor in this force, as they love the aspect of the additional armor plating. But you'll also see a lot of Mark II power armor in this force, because the high casualty rates and high attrition means that they basically pulled all the Mark II suits they can out of storage, just to keep supplying the fresh blood with. This Legion in particular does not like Mark VI power armor. Now, make of that what you will, but they deliberately uh, tried to get rid of it when they were issued it for prototype testing. They disliked it so much, and they actually succeeded in getting rid of that armor. Obviously, a time will come in the Horus Heresy when they say, well, we just got to use what's around, and Mark VI is around, therefore we're using it. So, like I say, anything can be justified if you put your mind to it. The Iron Warriors are a fantastic army when it comes to shooting, but once you remove them from that, they are very much lacking the tools to deal with much else. And unfortunately, uh, along with the Iron Hands, the Salamanders, the uh, World Eaters, the Raven Guard, this is one of those legions that doesn't have Praetor options yet available. And because their Praetor is a bit more unique, uh, being the... the uh, Basically, it's called the Warsmith. It's a souped-up tech marine meets a uh, chapter master of 40k term. And uh, you really just have to convert it currently. Unfortunately, there's no two ways about it. It's a bit of a shame. Uh, they desperately need to get characters, and they need to get their special HQs. Next along, we have the White Scars. Now, the White Scars are very much the Pathfinder of the Great Crusade. They are a legion which not many other legions know of or like, with the exception that the Thousand Sons and the Sons of Horus both thought very, very highly of them and saw them for what they really were worth. The White Scars have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because of this, but it doesn't rule their personality. They are into bikes, to put it very lightly. They are pseudo-Mongols. They are Mongols in space, they are Huns, they are Scythians, they are nomadic horse people that are given power armor, superhuman bodies, and bikes instead of horses. So treat that how you will. Unfortunately, bikes are not very good this edition, but of course this legion is able to make the most of them, and they're tailored towards that. That said, they are at the weaker end of the spectrum when it comes to legions and their performance. And, of course, they suffer from being overlooked quite a lot when it comes to picking armies because they are a more difficult force to paint. When it comes to their units, they actually have a wide variety of units. They even have their own dreadnoughts. I would suggest that their Leviathan dreadnought is, again, probably going to suffer from the same thing that has happened to their Contempted Dreadnought, in that you will be sold the torso in time, not the legs. They have plenty of upgrades available to them, and like the Dark Angels, because they're constantly at the edges of the Great Crusade, they love Mark II Power Armor. They have lots and lots of Mark II Power Armor, and they have bikes. Everywhere you can think of, they have bikes. That's the Legion. But again, nothing stopping you from playing them on foot. And there's some really cool concepts in there, like the Sagya Mazan. The Sagya Mazan is a essentially a suicide squad who let down their Primarch or failed him. Uh, originally, they intended to join Horus, not understanding the Horus heresy for what it was. And rather than executing them as punishment for this, they are told to basically redeem their honor by dying in glorious combat and take as many traitors with them as they can. And the Sagim Zang essentially do so. They are not looked after by the Legion. They are not given supplies. They are just told to basically head out like nomads and look after themselves. So you'll often find the Sagim Zang working with other loyalist legions, such as the Iron Hands. Uh, they form a very good relationship with them. Uh, and this leads to many successful ambushes of the traitors. Very cool concept. Next up we have the Space Wolves. Uh, now the Space Wolves Legion is seen as the Emperor's executioners. They are very much based off Viking and Norse mythology, uh, possibly a little bit too far leaning into it. And it can be a bit frustrating at times if you know what I mean. But as far as legions go, they are definitely in the stronger tiers of legions, with 
excellent variety of units, specialist units. Uh, the downside being that they have some of the worst sculpts in the heresy range. That's personal opinion, but take it how you will. I don't think too many people are going to argue that fact. Uh, between the banana fur and the wolf head helmets. Now, the Space Wolves excel in close combat. As the Emperor's Executioners, they feel they have the right or the duty to go and execute traitorous forces, and they do so. Like the Dark Angels, they believe in honor duels and personal combat. However, they are more of a savage force and lack the precision of the Dark Angels in prosecuting this. You'll see a lot of Mark III power armor in the, the Space Wolves because they do a lot of frontal assault. And this is backed up by the use of a lot of cataphracti armor, which is, well, it's the Mark III of Terminator armor. So you'll see this everywhere. The Space Wolves get savaged at the very start of the Heresy uh, as they take part in the Prospero campaign, which sees them taking on the Might of the Thousand Suns Legion, and they lose a lot of their numbers. Following this battle, they are then also ambushed by the Elf Legion at the Alaxes Nebula and use, uh, lose yet more numbers. So the Space Wolves are really running on empty for a lot of the Horus Heresy. They are better off than the Legions that fought at Istvan, but geez, not much better off, we'll say. So they are essentially in the process of rebuilding their Legion throughout the Horus Heresy and trying to get as many men and arms and armor and consolidate their forces back together in order to prosecute their own campaigns. Next along we have the Imperial Fists who are the poster boys of the Horus Heresy alongside the Sons of Horus. So the Imperial Fists uh, preferred play style is to be good at everything on the tabletop and they are. In actuality they are supposed to be a bit of an all-rounder more generalist legion, very good at holding the line when it comes to sieges as opposed to being the ones who do the assaulting in a siege. So they're sort of the counterweight or the opposite counterpart to the Iron Warriors. The Imperial Fists utilize many different types of elite units. They have very resilient Terminators, they have very resilient boarding troops, they have excellent duelists, but unfortunately every one of these units has a trade-off of some description. The Templar Brethren, for example, are an excellent sword and sword wielding unit uh, and they are let down by the fact that they are a sword wielding unit in the game that favors stronger weapons. The Phalanx Warders, a uh, very strong defensive unit able to take a lot of punishment but low on the number of attacks they have and they are only power armored at the end of the day. They are however many ways of buffing this legion into the stratosphere so keep that in the back of your mind. They also have a very simple Legion trait, which has a lot of really good that comes from it. They get a bonus to hit, where if you rolled, say, a 2 to hit, it counts as a 3 on the dice. So very, very handy when they are firing a lot of shooting weapons, because they are functionally increased ballistic skill when it comes to firing all bolt and auto weapons, which is the majority of ranged firepower in the game. As for their preferred armor, it is Mark III. They are very much a assault-based legion. They like to get up close in your face. Uh, and it's not that they want to get in there for close combat. It's that they want to get close enough to kill you with a bolt gun. They're funny like that. Next along, we have the Night Lords. Now, the Night Lords specialize in terror tactics. And it is a lot better portrayed in this edition of the game than the previous. The Night Lords, therefore, have a lot of grim trophies, skulls, lightning bolts, very much a Castlevania theme, we'll call it. And the Night Lords use their terror tactics to bring different worlds into subjugation throughout the Great Crusade. And by the time they go traitor, well, let's just say they weren't nice guys to begin with, so things only get a lot worse. Because in the past, they might have done horrible things to people in order to subjugate an enemy population. Now they're doing horrible things to people because they feel like it. The Legion is also made up of a bunch of condemned criminals, uh, murderers, the scum of the Primarch's homeworld, Nostromo, which is named uh, after Nostromo from the Alien franchise. Let's take that how you will. Now, very, very interesting Legion to play. Uh, I think their elite 
Leviathan will also go the way of the Dodo. So maybe get one when you can. They have some fantastic specialist units. The Night Wards are very much a hit and run, strike from the shadows, strike when your opponent is weak and you are strong sort of mentality. Uh, they're almost cowardly, lack honor, all of those sorts of traits. The most preferred type of armor you're going to see throughout this legion is generally going to be Mark IV. They are one of the trader legions that got given a lot of the better equipment by Horus as a reward for essentially siding with his way of viewing things. Next along we have the Blood Angels. The Blood Angels are the perfectionists uh, of the Loyalist Legion is Astartes. But where the Emperor's children try to be perfectionists, to the Blood Angels it just sort of comes to them naturally. The Blood Angels are very, very aggressive and unlike the Space Wolves who let the aggression take hold and really they just run with it, the Blood Angels temper it. They use self-discipline, uh, willpower to hold themselves in check and utilize their strength more responsibly. The Blood Angels as well see things like destroyers as a devoted duty that should be undertaken uh, and understanding the power that you wield in doing so. And therefore, they make quite extensive use of things like destroy companies. They see the need for it um, and they respect the fire power that it brings. The Blood Angels are an assault focused army, especially melee using jump pack infantry. And their toys really represent this. You'll see very short-ranged weaponry on their shooting units. You'll see a lot of assault-based units, Dawnbreaker Cohort, Crimson Paladins, all designed for getting in close with the enemy. They do have some interesting range options that other legions don't, such as Iliastus Assault Cannons, but on the whole, very much a close combat army. And being one of the most favoured legions in the background, they have a lot of Mark IV power armour given to them. Now the Blood Angels spend much of the start of the Horus Heresy essentially engaged in fighting against demons because they fall prey to a demonic ambush and this keeps them busy for the first couple of years of the war. So you can very much theme the force around demon slaying if you're that way inclined. Next along we have the Iron Hands. The Iron Hands have the dubious honour of losing their Primarch in the first five minutes of the Horus Heresy. Oops. But then again, he did a really dumb move, so it's not that surprising. Decided to charge face first at the enemy, essentially on his own. So not a great move for his Manus. But the Iron Hands as a whole are a very, very resilient legion. In fact, they're the most resilient legion on the tabletop with an ability which makes all weapons fired against them weaker because Iron Hands are just that damn tough. Now the Iron Hands tactics, essentially they're a ranged army, where, whereas an army like the Imperial Fists or the Iron Warriors gets bonuses to their shooting, instead the Iron Hands get a bonus to their defense against shooting. In addition to that, the Iron Hands also have access to some of the most impressive tech in the game, because, well, if you couldn't tell from all the cogs and gears and mechanical appendages and bionics on them. These guys love technology and building things and they have access to graviton shredders among other weapons which are a fantastic way of dealing with dreadnoughts in this edition. Wink wink nudge nudge. A very cool legion, awesome stuff, uh, interesting background and seeing how they have to basically cope without having their Primark at the start is pretty interesting on the tabletop. Obviously, if you couldn't tell, they love their Mark III power armor, and they use a lot of it. They also have access to a unique type of Terminator armor called the Gorgon Pattern. The Gorgon Terminator armor is a bit of a halfway house between a couple of other types of Terminator armor, with the benefit of it being able to blind enemies. It doesn't come up often, but it's a neat thing when it does. Next along, we have the, well, we have the World Eaters, who are absolutely psychopathic, by the time of the Horus Heresy. Now, unfortunately for the World Eaters, their Primarch was captured and essentially sold into slavery as a child. And as part of that process, his head was hacked open, part of his brain was ripped out, and a bunch of mechanical appendages were plugged in in its place, 
which are therefore slowly killing him because he is missing huge chunks of very important brain matter, but they also mean that he doesn't have full control of his emotions. In fact, the only emotions he really feels are related to him actually killing and murdering and slaying because of this mechanical device called the Butcher's Nails. Now, in order to bond with their father, the World Eaters Legion decided to undergo a similar process and had a cruder version of this implemented upon themselves, which obviously was not the brightest move, and the Butcher's Nails have since driven pretty much the entire Legion insane. And therefore, as they play into Korn's hand, these guys eventually do become the Korn Berserkers, they become more and more bloodthirsty and lose more and more control of their faculties as time goes on. They have very few units available to them in the Horus Heresy. The Rampages are incredibly strong at the moment due to one particular weapon. However, I think you only get one or two sets of that weapon in their box, so it makes it a bit difficult to build the unit correctly. But... They've got a lot of upgrade options, and the World Eaters are, of course, a very infantry-heavy army with a focus on Mark II power armor, but they also had a surprising amount of Mark IV, as they were, again, a favored legion of the War Master, who diverted Mark IV supplies to many of his favorite legions, aka the ones who sided with him. Next up, we have the Ultramarines. Unlike in 40k, the Ultramarines of 30k are incredibly tolerable because they are not the poster children, that's the Emperor's, uh, sorry, the Imperial Fists, uh, the poster children of the Horus Heresy. So, the Ultramarines are very much your vanilla faction, and they're more buffed around having interconnected tactics. So multiple squads working together to take down one enemy will grant certain bonuses. This is pretty thematic to them. And they have some of the best specialist units in the game, however, most of them are locked behind a PDF document, and since they have no models, you will have to get out the old conversion tools to make many of them. The Ultramarines are very bland and vanilla when it comes to characters and specialist war gear, they don't have a huge variety of it, they also only have access to one ride of war. That said, very good legion, relatively strong legion, uh, especially due to having just fantastic specialist um, units. And their preferred armor is generally Mark IV, because unlike other legions, they actually had the facilities to make many of their own tools and armor from scratch, because the Ultramarines controlled such a large empire within the Imperium. Uh, the Ultima Segmentum is essentially theirs, and yeah, it has many forge worlds and refinery planets and such, and they even invented their own versions of certain armor types. And that's how we end up with things like Praetorian armor and Invictari pattern and such. Moving on from the Ultramarines, we get to the Death Guard. Now, the Death Guard are chemical warfare specialists prior to the Horus Heresy. And once they get going in the Horus Heresy, they start falling to Nurgle, and you see many of these things taking place, where they, you know, virus bomb or poison whole villages or cities or planets of their enemies. And they themselves become smellier as time goes on, I'm sure many of you are aware, because they eventually become the Plague Marines by the Siege of Terror and at the Siege of Terror. So... The Death Guard, obviously a focus on chemical weapons, lots of short-ranged flame weapons, uh, chemical bombs that they can throw, phosphex bombs, rad grenades, all that sort of thing, as well as having power sides for their more elite units and champions. The Death Guard as a whole are a very resilient legion, they have excellent tools for getting the job done, but they don't excel in any one area. They're sort of like the... Uh, Iron Hands, that they have a certain resilience or a certain inclination towards certain tendencies, such as a bit of survivability when it comes to chemical weapons and warfare, and where the Iron Hands have, say, Graviton weapons, a sign of their technical superiority, these guys have access to a lot of chemical and radiation weapons as a sign of their, well, nasty tactics. The favoured armour mark of these guys is Mark III. So Mark III power armor for the Death Guard. 
who are huge on trench warfare in much the same way that the Iron Warriors are. Not huge fans of tanks as well, by the way. Next Legion is the Thousand Sons, the Psyker Legion, and they are, to be honest, in a bad place rules-wise this edition. They are not very good. Psykers are good in this edition, but the way the Thousand Sons rules are written do not work well with the rules for Psykers. Uh, they are not particularly better at it than other legions are, which is a real shame considering this legion it's supposed to be their speciality that they're built around. They have a lot of unique legion units and a lot of variety, however, pretty much all of them are bad, so not in a great place. But the Thousand Suns throughout the Great Crusade are a legion that focused on retaining the knowledge of worlds they conquered, and generally tried not to conquer worlds through brutal subjugation, but through influence and negotiation, convincing the world that, you know, it's, it's a good idea to join the Imperium, there are many benefits to doing so, and in fact, here are some of them for you now, and rather than brutally subjugate you, we are going to help you, and we're going to bring you better resources, and educate your people, and improve your healthcare system, and, you know, and many planets obviously fell into this, and it worked out quite well, but the problem is, that approach is, it's a bit slow, and especially when you decide to linger around on a planet for a few weeks or years to read through their library archives and you aren't out there prosecuting the war, certain other legions in grey power armour tend to get pissy at you because, well, they think they're getting the job done and you are not. This of course meant the Thousand Suns had very few friends, and because they used uh, psychers, which is already a bit of a no-no, uh, a frowned upon practice, although accepted in the Imperium, it meant that they lost many more friends to the degree where they really only had two or three other legions that liked them, which is probably the lowest of all the legions. Uh, the Thousand Sons have Mark IV as their favoured armour mark, and that's mostly down to the fact that there are so few of them, it was very easy to get a lot of it uh, prior to the Horus Heresy breaking out. Next, of course, the War Master and his legion, the Sons of Horus. So, Horus's forces, Horus Lupercal's forces, are very much like the Blood Angels. Brutal force, but somewhat controlled, whereas the World Eaters are just let loose and the Night Lords are given in to their more sadistic nature, the Sons of Horus are much more balanced in that regard. They are, however, not to be trifled with, they can be absolutely brutal when they want to be, it is controlled aggression. They are sort of the poster children throughout the Great Crusade because they get their Primarch very early on and, not to put too fine a point on it, get given a lot of the easier assignments. Now, it's not to say that they had an easy time of it in the Great Crusade, but when you have the Dark Angels of the Space Wolves get sent to fight the Rangdan, and they lose something like 80% of their numbers in the first few campaigns, meanwhile the Sons of Horus get sent to conquer the Happy Unicorn Planet, you can see why the Sons of Horus rack up more victories, and for some reason people equate this with Horus being a very successful general. In actuality, Horus was very, very good at making friends with everyone, and that's why he was the prime candidate for Warmaster. Not because he was the best general, not because he was the greatest warrior, not just because his legion had so many victories, but because he was the least unlikable guy to all of the other Primarchs, except maybe Vulcan. And because of this, the ability to actually, you know, make people like him, he stood apart from the other potential claimants. Gilliman? Mm, not very well liked. Rogel Dawn? Very insular, quiet, not well liked. Uh, the Lion, definitely better at everything than Horus, except for the fact that the Lion's personality is designed to rub people the wrong way. Uh, and Ferris Manus, who is like the Lion, but deliberately acts that way. He, he, he doesn't. The Lion doesn't realise he's being an idiot or a dickhead. Uh, Ferris realises it and revels in it because he doesn't like people, which is kind of identifiable. But anyway, the Sons of Horus, obviously, they have the best of everything, and therefore they are full of Mark IV power armor leading into the Horus Heresy. Because Horus has been in charge of the Imperium's military for a couple of decades by this point, and he has made sure that all sorts of good supplies came to him. In addition to that, he has also made alliances with the Mechanicum on Mars, in particular the Fabricated General, the head of the entire Mechanicum, uh, Mechanicum Space Pope I guess you could say. 
is good friends with Horus and gave him a lot of really good equipment. Now, whilst this is not represented well in the game's rules and mechanics, it is really good for building different thematic forces with on the tabletop. So do with that information as you will. Next along, we have the word bearers, the guys who ruined it all for everyone. So prior to things turning bad for everyone, the word bearers essentially saw their role as iconoclasts. They would go out and they were the inquisitors who would purge foreign religions and subjugate the masses and convert them over to worship of the emperor and the imperium. The problem is in 30k is that the emperor doesn't want to be worshipped. That is very much a 40k mentality, ironically brought about by the actions of Lorgar, who wrote a book about how divine the emperor was and how he was a god. And well, by 40k, that has become a, a gospel, which is ironic considering it's written by essentially the Antichrist here. Space Judas, I guess you call him. Now, the Imperial Herald's Legion, which is what the word bearers were at one point, went around to these planets, burned all the sacred texts about their own gods, and essentially rebuilt the societies in the style that they saw best, along with, you know, religion and such. Uh, religion towards the Emperor. The Emperor got so annoyed at this, he decided that the only way to teach Lorgar a lesson was rather than sit down with him to get Gilliman to blow up one of his cities and then... The Emperor forced Wargar and his entire legion to kneel before him, whilst Gilliman sort of left standing there. So this creates a slight bit of resentment, as you can imagine, for Wargar. And Wargar being told that, no, the Emperor is not a god, and you're an idiot, and having these beautiful cities he's built destroyed in front of him, as well as being humiliated in front of his brother, it kind of snaps him. And in looking for an answer to all of his problems, he ends up finding chaos is the answer and becomes the first heretic the first one to fall to chaos of the primarchs this of course is spurred on by two particular characters Erebus and Corferon who are they're up there for being some of the biggest dicks in all of 30k and 40k anyway the word bearers well they've got things like possessed and uh nasty demonic type units we'll say because they get into it early and they are very good at using this stuff by the time that the Horus heresy takes place they have possessed dreadnoughts possessed space marines they have all sort of witchy poo stuff and they love it they are very good when it comes to morale because they are just iconoclasts driven by zeal and faith However, they are no better at fighting actual battles than other legions. So essentially it's this faith and zeal that has to carry them through the difficulty of actually winning the fight. Word bearers preferred Mark IV power armor, but because they were one of the larger legions, they had a decent amount of every type of armor mark. If in doubt when you're wondering what armor mark would suit your legion best, have a look at the original Heresy 1.0 heads. So not the new Mark VI heads that you'll see, but the old school heads. You'll see in this case they're Mark IV. Next legion here, like the Salamanders, you'll see a lot of Mark III, but also some Mark IV in there. So the Salamanders. The Salamanders are the nice guy legion. So their antithesis or counterpart would be the Death Guard. So where the Death Guard use chemical weapons, chemical warfare, uh, some level of terror tactics. The Salamanders are all about using fire uh, so they burn away the chemical residues and they don't believe in using radiation weapons. And unlike the Death Guard who war is a sort of grim task and it's a calculated task and there will be casualties on the civilian side and who cares as long as we get the job done. The Salamanders are the only legion that is willing to throw themselves in front of a civilian. The only legion that will throw themselves on a hand grenade to save regular humans. And in that task they're the most human of the legions uh, and they are really considered the nice guys. Uh, which is ironic because they burn people to death. So, work that one out. Reconcile the two. Now, the Salamanders definitely prefer Mark III. However, the Salamanders are one of those forge legions, like the Iron Hands, and therefore they build a lot of really fancy tech for themselves, and they have forge ship. They have a relic forge ship, which is able to make pretty much anything they like. 
And so you will see things like Mark IV Power Armor in there because they could make it with relative ease. They weren't dependent on Mars for supply and they weren't having their supplies rerouted by Horus. They were very much independent in that regard and their planet as a whole focused on the forging and making of things because they come from a volcanic world that is rich in mineral wealth. Now, the Salamanders obviously have a lot of stuff available to them, but the Legion is awful on the tabletop, thankfully saved by having some really good rights of war and two of the best units in the game. Keeping that theme in mind, the Raven Guard, the last of the Loyalist Legions, the Raven Guard are also terribly written rules-wise, with underwhelming rights of war in this case, but fantastic. Fantastic specialist units. Again, some of the best in the game. So they share that in common with the Salamanders, and like the Salamanders, the World Eaters, the Iron Hands, the Iron Warriors, they lack any sorts of consoles or anything like that. Now, the Raven Guard's whole deal is they focus on essentially what we would call actual tactics here in 21st century Earth. The Raven Guard would prefer to use camouflage, to hide in the shadows, to create ambushes, to take out enemy leadership, to have total control of the situation at all times, and tactical advantage, as opposed to going in all guns blazing with a bolt pistol and chainsaw and running at a tank and trying to hack it to pieces. That is not really their approach in 30k. And to be fair, they, they do this approach well. They are some of the best snipers and marksmen in the game. They are well camouflaged, and their rules are built around that. Unfortunately, where it falls apart for them is in the rules for everything else. They are, of course, big fans of the Mark VI Power Armor, and although they are associated with it, at the start of the Horus Heresy and Isvan V, they actually don't have that much of it. They have about 3,000 suits of Mark VI Power Armor out of 80,000 Marines or so that go to Isvan, which means that a good 70 to 80,000 Marines were in other types of Power Armor, specifically a lot of Mark II. And the reason for this is because they spent so much time away from the center of the Great Crusade, prosecuting their campaigns in relative obscurity. Uh, everyone forgot the Raven Guard existed, so the Raven Guard never got good stuff. And the reason they got Mark VI in the first place was it was handed to them by Perturabo as a way of essentially getting it killed, because who cares what a no-name legion has to say about this armor? And, well, it kind of backfired on Perturabo. And lastly for today, we have the Alpha Legion. Now, the Alpha Legion are, well, they're the dark counterpart to the Raven Guard, whereas the Raven Guard prefer to use infiltration tactics for things like assassination. Well, the Elf Legion will use infiltration tactics for the purposes of sowing chaos. Uh, sowing chaos amongst your ranks, uh, throwing you for a six, and there are times where, just to prove a point in the Great Crusade, the Elf Legion would essentially make the fight, the situation, more difficult than it had to be, just so it looked more impressive when they won it with their weird and bizarre tactics. Yeah, you can see how well that panned out. In any case, they don't have a huge variety of units, war gear, or specialist rules. However, what they do have works quite well, and in fact, the weakest unit in their army is the Terminators. Their specialist headhunter kill teams and their effort squads, which are one of those units that you have to make yourself because they come from a PDF, are fantastic on the tabletop. And the Elf Legion... Well, they favoured Mark IV power armor, but they also had a lot of Mark VI power armor creeping in there because they, well, using infiltration and subterfuge, stole the plans for it and were producing it in secret in their own facilities prior to the Horus Heresy taking place. So if you really want Mark VI power armor, Raven Guard, Elf Legion, perfect two candidates to use it on. Now, the Alpha Legion are a very good legion on the tabletop, I won't lie. But they are in a bit of a funny place when it comes to, you know, tanks and terminators and things like that. They don't benefit too much from their legion traits. But what really marks them out as special or different is that the Alpha Legion can take another legion specialist unit and use it themselves. So all of those cool units that you might have seen in the background of today's video 
imagine taking some of those in your Elf Legion force. That's a pretty cool thing. Anyway, that's it for this episode of Getting Started in the Horus Heresy. I hope I've given you a bit of an overview of the different legions, their tactics, their preferred armor and methodologies, and hopefully you gain something from this. Now, I want to do the same sort of episode again for the Custodes, the Sisters of Silence, the Knights, Militia, that sort of thing, but I want to hold out a little bit because I want actual Militia Demons of the Ruinstorm rules to drop, and then maybe I can go into the couple of the different types of, say, provenances of war of such, uh, and go into a bit of depth there, talk about the different forces of the Solar Auxilia, otherwise it's going to be an episode that's like, this is the Solar Auxilia, they exist, the end. And I think that would be quite boring to people, so... We'll hang five on that one, but if you really want something soon, we are looking at doing a getting started in Horus Heresy on the Solar Auxilia. Uh, Kat is going to do the Mechanicum, and yeah, let's just say both those factions are in a really sticky place, but that's for another episode. Anyway, I'm back with the Outer Circle. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all on the next one.